four, three, two, one. Right. Some people uh, do effective instruction studies because they are genuinely looking for ways of improving teaching. Other people do them because they want to get published. And it's that kind of person I'm going to address this Pesha Kucha to. My first one, by the way, as well. And I think the slides will do all talking. So this is how you start. You choose a treatment that is likely to help your experimental group, and then you invent another treatment that is likely to hinder learning in your comparison group. <laughs> That's the first step. That's a crucial step to get to the right results. Um, when you report this, of course, you should say that your comparison treatment is common practice in your neck of the woods. <laughs> what works for me always is to go to traditional method. No one will question that now. So it works, it works. Com com very convincing. Um, this is slide number two. <laughs> the slide number three is your choice of participants. You need, of course, highly motivated learners to be in your experimental group, and then you recruit other students for the comparison group. Okay. Uh, again, in your report, you say that two groups were on a par. You can add something like a pretest, like body mass index or something. Um, you make your experimental group feel very special by telling them that they'll benefit from this very innovative <laughs> method. And the comparison group could be made feel special by giving them, it works for me, a couple of pints of strong Belgian ale. Uh, if you can't find that, you can also use wine as long as it is just 10 minutes before the treatment. <laughs> then the treatment, you of course need to make sure the experimental group learns, so you teach them. The comparison group you either send home or you teach them something else. <laughs> you see these things in published research, actually. Um, you tell the experimental group that they will do post-test. You don't tell the comparison group. That's a surprise. Because we know that intentional learning tends to yield better results. And you want your experimental group to outperform comparison group, obviously. Because positive evidence gets published, negative evidence hard to get published. Then you select a test format in the post-test that really imitates the treatment that the experimental group has received. And you make sure it's completely incomprehensible for comparison. <laughs> so make sure there's some kind of practice test congruency effect hmm, for the experimental group. Uh, another option is to forget to remove the key. Again, don't say this in your paper. <laughs> and only tell your closest friends. Not even your wife. Um, processing data, that's where you can do very uh, useful things as well. Uh, you can start by deleting test items that didn't work so well. And then, of course, you proceed by removing outliers from your statistics until you reach significance. Okay. If it's in favor of your experimental treatment, of course, otherwise. So the things that I've done as well is asking developed research assistants to do it for you, but of course telling them what kind of results you want, and you make sure that they know which group is the experimental group. Okay. <laughs> This can be an additional uh, motivation for the uh, research assistant as well. Um, <laughs> Report the findings. Uh, academic writing is, of course, hard to do. Something you can do is, if you have, say, a test that consists of just eight test items, turn these scores into percentage scores. Close it up, and then you use gigantic bar charts with <laughs> and, uh, so, so minimal differences can then be magnified, which is convincing. And then if results fall short of significance, then you just say that it was because you had too small a uh, sample size. But surely, if the sample size is a little bit bigger, you would have reached that significance. <laughs> this is slide. I can come over. <laughs> Don't say how little learning actually took place in the experimental group, but focus on how poorly the comparison group did. That's something you very often find. Sometimes you find uh, uh, that the comparison group underwent such a lousy treatment that they regressed. 
useful. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, nowadays it's fashionable to report mixed methods. So if yours is a quantitative study, then you should add something qualitative. Like, okay, they didn't learn so much, but at least they liked it. If you have a qualitative study, you should add a graph or a table somewhere. <laughs> Anything will do. Uh, yeah, something I've also uh, tried, uh, in your discussion section, for example, you can add something like personal communication and you refer to a very reputed, uh, well-known scholar, some kind of uh, authority uh, argument. They will not know that they have never had a conversation with you anyway. <laughs> Busy people. Uh, also state in your conclusion that your paper was very interesting. <laughs> and assert that your findings have far-reaching implications. But of course, you don't have enough room to say what those implications might possibly be. Very <laughs> limits. And then you acknowledge that there were some shortcomings to your study. I only mention the obvious one, but not the really problematic ones. And then say, uh, there were sh shortcoming limitations, but I'm right anyway. <laughs> I don't know how many slides there oh, yeah. And think of your future. So, of course, in a reference list, find a way to put as many references to your own work. <laughs> if you have comic strips, recipe books, doesn't matter. You find a way of tying it in with your, with your research. Okay. And I think that's my uh, picture culture.